and Brian on the multiple guitars, Radana on the keyboard. Well, they say that young people today are so afraid, so stressed, so fearful that the term some psychologists and psychiatrists are referring to them as is generation paranoia. For example, young people today are afraid, obviously, that they won't have enough money to afford anything, much less a house or to be able to retire someday. Social media feeds insecure adolescents a constant diet of issues to fret about, to feel inferior about, to feel left out about, and most young people don't have enough life experiences yet or the inner resources to sort through all of those complex and disillusioning messages that they're getting all the time. As young children, a generation paranoia, were not allowed to go outside and play by themselves because, of course, a stranger would probably kidnap them. They heard all the time about school shootings, and you can imagine the effects that would have on their security. Although actual child abductions only happen to about 65 kids a year or one out of every million, and even though there are 130,000 K through 12 schools, 55 million students, only about 10 per year are killed by school shooters. Humans, especially children, can't process that kind of statistical information, you know, with a, with a detachment that we can maybe as adults. To them, and maybe many adults also, these terrible and tragic events that I mentioned seem to be happening everywhere all the time. Local stories go national, and then they're played and replayed. It's an infinite loop of bad news that Generation Paranoia has grown up with. Well, speaking of fear, one time Jesus asked his disciples a question that we might ask today's younger people, or many of us also, why are you so afraid? Why are you so anxious? Why are you so stressed so much of the time? Well, if you're new with us today, over the past couple of months, we've been in a series called Questions Jesus Asked, and 305 times in the Bible, Jesus asks people questions, a few of which that we've addressed are, if you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? He asks, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Last week, we talked about, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How about how will OU football do as they make the move to the SEC? Jesus did not ask that question, but all of us have many, many times, and it fills us with fear. Now, when it comes to fear, all of us have something. I'll bet all of us here have something. How many of you, for instance, are afraid of snakes and spiders? Raise your hand. Those of you who aren't are just kind of weird. People have reptiles in their house. I, 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 would, I, don't, I couldn't do that. How many of you are afraid of heights? Yeah, me too. How about the fear of speaking in front of a crowd? They say that's a, that's a big one for some odd reason. I, that doesn't bother me. Let's test your phobia knowledge. Claustrophobia is the fear of enclosed or getting stuck or in small places. Cynophobia is what? Anybody here know? The fear of sentiment. No, it's the fear of needles. Trypanophobia, no, I'm sorry, that's the fear of dogs. I just gave away the next one. Trypanophobia, that's the fear of needles. Then there is phobia. that's the fear of giants, of course. I can't pronounce this next one, but anyone know what the uh, fear of this is the fear of? It's the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. I bet some of you have this and don't know it, nomophobia. This is a newer one. It's the fear of being without your cell phone. I can put some of us into a panic. And finally, this last one, uh, that is actually the fear of long words. I'm not making that one up. That's true. But today we're not going to talk about kind of these silly, highly unusual fears, but we're going to talk about real ones, the kind that really cause sleepless nights sometimes, that cause levels of anxiety that we can feel all over. Now today, what if we could somehow put up on this screen the list of your deepest and greatest fears that you've had in your life or have right now? I bet some of them would be financial fears. 
Some would be health-related fears. Maybe just fears of what direction our crazy world is headed in. And although you wouldn't know it from the calm, polished exteriors that most of us sort of project in a crowd like this, if the truth were known, many of us here are well acquainted with the tyrannizing and even debilitating effects of fear. Now, here's why we're talking about fear on Easter Sunday. You know what the first words were that the angel asked the, uh, said to the women when they came to the tomb? Don't be afraid. What were the first words Jesus told the women to tell his disciples? Don't be afraid. So there's obviously some kind of connection between what had just happened, you know, Jesus' death on the cross three days later, resurrected from the dead. There's something about that that apparently should help eliminate or at least alleviate and diminish our fears. Then when Jesus himself appeared to his followers after his death, his first words were, why are you so afraid? Now they were probably like, well, Jesus, a few days ago, we saw you hang on a cross and die, and then you got put in a grave, and now you're back alive. So yeah, we're a little freaked out over this. That, that doesn't happen every day. We're, it's, it's kind of scary. Proverbs 12, 25 makes a statement that we all know is true. A fearful heart wears a man or a woman down. We all know that. A fearful heart just seems to drain the life right out of us. When people look at life primarily through eyes of fear, they tend to do what psychologists call catastrophizing. All of us are familiar probably familiar with this, some more than others. It's where your minds and emotions just get traumatized by playing out worst case scenarios. And all of those negative thoughts and negative emotions take a toll on you over time. They undermine the quality of your life. They affect your relationships. Fear can actually just snatch the joy and the peace right out of your life. And since the COVID pandemic hit in 2020, Fear has increased dramatically in our country and really around the world. And what I'm going to do today is list some of the factors that are, are responsible uh, for causing this rise in fear. And if you look on the back side of your announcement sheet, you will see a list of 25 things. I hope you don't have a lot of plans for this afternoon. It's going to take a while. No, actually, it won't be a longer than usual talk, I don't think. I'm going to mention each one and maybe a little information on each one. And then I want to ask you, if, if you want to do this, you don't have to, but to rate yourself from 0 to 10 on how feel, fearful you are about each particular issue. All right, and you can write it down on there if you want or just do it in your head. A recent uh, survey was done in America about fear, and the very top one was financial fear makes sense with what's going on in our world today. Over 50% of Americans say that they regularly feel fear about their financial future and the fear in the financial future of their children. I don't have to tell you that everything in the world seems to have increased dramatically in, in cost. Groceries, car, gas, health care, rent, mortgages. 50 years ago, the average home in our country sold for $32,500. The average home today costs $395,000. That's the average. That's an increase of 1,215%. Recently, I started, saw that Ringo Starr was going to uh, be playing down at the Windstar Casino, you know, down on I-35. I told Jan, it's like, hey, that'd be kind of fun to go. She goes, yeah, sure. So I looked up uh, the, the, the tickets. The prices were only $450, the cheapest. $450 per person. We didn't go. <laughs> I read this week about a two-bedroom apartment in New York City rents for $4,800 a month. 814 square feet rents for almost $5,000 a month. It's just gotten crazy. So rate yourself. If you feel like you have a lot of financial fear these days, put an 8, 9, or 10. If you feel like maybe you don't, first I'd say check your pulse. Make sure you're still alive if you don't have any financial fears. But uh, anyway, put down your score. The second most common fear that people put in this recent survey of Americans is the lack of confidence in our government. Can the Democrats and Republicans ever work together for the good of the American people like they're supposed to? 
Can political division, is it ever going to get better? 60% of Americans believe that most government officials are corrupt, cannot be trusted, and do not reserve, deserve our respect or admiration. Our judicial system is losing trust. The FBI, the Department of Justice, even our military has become enmeshed in social issues instead of just being prepared to protect our country. How the government handled uh, the pandemic has caused immense damage to their credibility. So give, yourself, give a score on how optimistic or pessimistic you are about this one from 1 to 10. Number three, violent crime is on the rise. We all see it on TV. Stores are closing all over cities like Chicago, San Francisco, New York City, because people are just walking in, smashing displays with hammers and taking who knows how many thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. Carjacking is up. Physical, uh, physical assaults are happening on the streets of cities for no reason whatsoever. Just people walking up, punching women and so forth. And a lot of state, local, and federal pro prosecutors are just not doing anything about it. If someone is arrested, they're let out of jail, they might probably go back and start committing more crimes in the community. As many as 100,000 people a year are now leaving New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, because people are so afraid and frustrated over the quality of life. So put down a score on this one. Are you okay with what, how things are going on? Does it make you pretty nervous? Number four, the federal deficit. We don't really think about this that much, but I came across this little graphic recently. It says a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years, quite a jump. A trillion seconds is almost 32,000 years. So when you hear a trillion dollars thrown around, compare it to a million dollars, that's a lot of money. It's an incredible amount of money. And our current national debt is $34 trillion, almost $100,000 of debt for every single man, woman, and child in our country. That makes you feel good? Put a one or two. That makes you not feel so good? Put a higher score. Then, of course, there's the immigration uh, crisis. The latest estimates are that at least 10 million people have come across our southern border over the last three years. And why not? I mean, they're promised Free cell phones, debit cards, hotel rooms. How many are criminals, gang members, terrorists? Some, for sure. How many? We don't know. And where are they going to go? Where are they all going to live? Where are they going to find jobs? Where are they going to find housing? How will this tax our public school system, our, our, our health care system, and so forth? It's it just, it just unsustainable. So put down a number that reflects kind of how you feel about that. Number six, cybercrime. How many of you have ever had a credit card hacked? Raise your hand. I mean, like almost all of us in this place at one time or another. So as technology gets more sophisticated and criminals get more sophisticated, is this going to get better? It's probably going to get worse. So put a number to reflect your level of comfort or fear. How about this one? China's growing power. We've known for years that American companies will spend millions, maybe billion dollars of research and development only to have the Chinese steal the technology and then they pay children basically, no wages whatsoever, and then sell those products to America, to Americans at a greatly reduced price of what American companies can sell the same thing for because of what I just mentioned. I recently, I read recently that one of China's biggest priorities now is to develop the capacity to disrupt or debilitate our national security grids, air traffic control systems, and our satellites to keep all the information and internet working. Can you imagine the chaos if large swaths of America just lost electricity, and not for an hour, not for a day, not for weeks, months and months? Can you imagine what would happen to our society? What if it, the internet just didn't work? And people, you couldn't go to a store and buy anything because they don't take credit cards, their, their cash registers don't work. What, what would happen? Put a number, one of 10, your level of fear about that one. Then there's the plague of addiction in America. 47 million Americans are struggle with drug or alcohol addictions. 28 million are still smokers. Millions and millions of young men are now becoming, between like the ages of 19 and 30, are becoming addicted to sports gambling. 
There's pornography, sex addictions, eating addictions, shopping addictions. All of us know the price that is paid with somebody in our family, in our life, who has an addiction. Not only them, but the family around them pays. From one to ten, what's your level of fear of addictions going forward? Number nine, the decline of religion and moral values in our country. In 1950, 90% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. 63% attended church on a regular basis. Today, less than half claim to be Christians, and only about 30% attend church. People are, they, you know, on surveys have indicated people are less honest than they used to be. They lie more. They're not as kind. They're not as, as considerate. Some people are fine with this, don't think it makes any difference. Other people are very concerned that the beliefs, and traits that built this country to be as great as it is, as they're becoming extinct, what's going to happen to future generations? So rate yourself of level of fear on this one. Number 10 is the issue of media bias. You know, when different media outlets, be it TV news, large internet companies, or newspapers, present the news, not objectively, but with a very definite political or philosophical slant, how can you trust what you hear, what you see? Whether it's CNN News or Fox News, 60 Minutes or Nightline, the New York Times or the Oklahoman or the Woklahoman, as some people are referring to it now, it is no longer just the facts. It's political spin, and it's just almost impossible to sort your way through it and figure out if there's any truth in there. How do you feel about that? Mark a number. Number 11 is the decline of the family. We all know that the divorce rate is still about 50%, but the marriage rate is plummeting. And people are having fewer and fewer children, almost children, almost to the point of where we can't keep up with the, you know, the population can't keep going forward. For centuries, virtually all cultures in the whole world, the family was the cornerstone of any society. Well, American families have undergone an incredible transformation over the past 50, 60 years, and not for the better. How is our nation going forward? going to have, you know, what's it going to be like if this trend continues? Put a number down, uh, reflect how you feel about that one. Here's another reason that fear is very very much on the rise as as our culture ages, health issues, you know, cancer, diabetes, strokes, heart problems, dementia, prostate issues, obesity, and of course, there's the cost, just the cost, not only the health issues themselves, but the cost of it. Some of you may know that Jana had a kidney stone in January. She spent less than 24 hours in the hospital. We got the bill a couple of weeks ago. It was $28,000. I'm not kidding. Now, fortunately, she has good insurance through OU. We only had to pay $800 of that. But can you imagine how devastating that is for people who don't have good insurance or don't have it at all? What, you, can't, you can't not go get the, you know, the procedure or whatever. How good do you feel? How fearful do you feel about your health, the health of the ones you love, and the cost of that health? Put down a number. Then there's the public school crisis. I mean, should parents have any say in what their kids are taught? Should males and females use the same restrooms and the same locker rooms? Should public schools allow any and all books for any and all ages? I mean, you've seen, you've heard all of this. COVID setback students a year, two years, what can be done to make that up? I mean, it's a real problem. And as schools become more dangerous, more controversial, more and more parents are moving their kids out to private schools, to religious schools, to home schools, which is beginning to leave many public schools empty enough where they cannot sustain having that school open anymore because there just aren't enough kids and there aren't enough teachers. And this creates an incredible amount of uncertainty and apprehension in people. So put a number that you think reflects kind of how confident or how fearful you are about what's happening in our public schools and colleges. Number four, climate change. Of course, some people think this is a hoax. Some people believe it's the end of the world as we know it. And if you, you know, if we were to turn our country upside down, trying to meet all of the new requirements and so forth uh, of emissions and, you know, what if the rest of the world, countries in the world don't cooperate? We're only 4% of the world's population here in America, 4%. So almost no matter what we do, 
if others don't, nothing's going to happen really. What's your level of fear on that one? Well, here's another one that has caused upheaval in our country, and it's sometimes just referred to as civil unrest. It's when people, regular civilians, regular, you know, uh, uh, Americans have issues that they're, they're so frustrated, they're so angry about that they have to get out and march. They want to do something. They want to make a statement. And all of us can certainly remember the death of George Floyd in 2020 resulted in calls for to defund the police and the Black Lives Movement uh, grew out of that. And to some people, just the belief that all white people are racist. The Supreme Court then limited abortion, and people went out, civil rights, and they marched about that. We've seen it in school board meetings that are filled with anger and physical alteration, uh, altercations. And I don't know if you feel better about life when you see these things happening on TV, or if you feel more insecure about the future of our country and, and of your family, but how afraid or comfortable you are with those, put down a number. Number 16, the threat of nuclear war. Just within the last two weeks, Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that he is prepared to use nuclear weapons if Russia's sovereignty or independence is threatened. North Korea has nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. And while we've always thought, well, no world leader is going to be so evil, so self-destructive that they would take that step. But the unthinkable seems a little more realistic maybe than ever before. What's your level of fear in that regard? Then how about the philosophy of relativism, which has permeated our culture? Relativism is the belief that there is no such thing as objective truth, but that each person just determines for themselves what is reality and what's not, what's right and what's wrong. And today in our country, 66% of all adults and 91% of teenagers believe there is no such thing as absolute truth anymore. How's that going to work going forward? But are one or two, if you think everything's okay, it's a bigger problem if you think it's going to be or and is, but a higher number. Number 18, how about toxic people in your life to raise the level of fear? If you are unfortunate enough to have or have had a toxic person in your life, then you know the frustration and desperation that it's like to, to deal with a manipulative, ruthless, narcissistic, high-conflict person on a regular basis. A toxic person can, ex can create extreme stress and fear in your life. If you're free of that right now, thank God, put a low number. If you're not free of that right now and you know all about this, I'm sure you'll put a higher number. How about the threat of, of terror terrorism? We recently saw in October what Hamas did in Israel and then the complications and everything that's happened since then. There's also ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and many others. You know, when someone's religion, when the essence of their religion is to destroy you, what do you, what do, you do with that? You know, when millions of a people are devoted to death to America, what do we do? Rate your level of anxiety on that one. From one to ten. Number twenty, homelessness, homelessness and poverty. You know, I'm, maybe I'm naive about this, but I don't understand how in the year 2020 we're still dealing with this at the level that we are, and it's actually getting worse because of the economic situation in our country. How do we solve it? Oklahoma City, I read this week, has a homeless population of around 1,500 people. The city spends about $9 million a year on homelessness. That's about $6,000 per homeless person. Is it working? I, I don't know what, what the answer is. Uh, I don't know how optimistic or pessimistic you are about that, but put down a number, 1 to 10. Closely related to that are mental health issues. You know, most severely ill people now are homeless or are in prison. Those are kind of the two options left in our society these days. However, many millions of regular people like us deal with emotional problems and mental issues, maybe on a smaller scale. No doubt some in this room go to therapy to deal with some of these issues or take medicines for anxiety or depression, post-traumatic stress, and so forth. 
this is okay with you right now, then you can put a lower number, or if you're concerned for larger society, you could put a higher number, whatever it would be for you. So again, what we're doing is considering a question that Jesus asked right after his resurrection, and that question was, why are you so afraid? And we're going through a list of causes and reasons that fear has risen so dramatically in the last few years in our world. The next one is the impact of social media. Now, I alluded to this at the start of my talk, remember Generation Paranoia, but platforms such as Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, and Twitter are not only giving young people a distorted picture of life, but the rest of us as well. And studies have shown that the more time people spend online on, or on their phones, the more depressed they are, the more lonely they are, the more isolated they feel, the more unhappy they are. However, if you tell them that, will they stop? Will they cut back on the amount of time they spend online? No, they will not. Yes, it makes them sad. Yes, it makes them feel alone. Yes, it makes them feel worse about themselves. But they are addicted. They can't even imagine what life would be like if they didn't have con constantly on, on their phone or online. What's your fear score on this one is what it's doing to members of your family, our society as a whole. Along that same line, there's the fear and uncertainty about the future of AI, artificial intelligence. Surely you've heard by now about Google's new Gemini AI program. It was built, it was designed by people who apparently hate white people, who feel that all white people are the cause of the, the world's problems. And so if you type in a search like, not a single image will show up of a white person. You maybe have seen this. You type in the Pope, and here, here's what you get. You type in Nazi German shoulder, shoulder, soldiers, and this is what you get. You type in speedy Swedish woman. And AI is programmed by people who have radical political or social or economic or sexual views, and then those views permeate all of the information that you get through AI. It's, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. Put a score down on that one. Okay, just a couple of more. Number 24, gun violence, the spread of gun violence. In 2023, over 40,000 people in the U.S. died from gunshots. Now, half of those were suicides, but about 1,300 teenagers were murdered with guns and 276 children were now, this is not necessarily the time to debate the Second Amendment. Some want to ban all guns, and of course, some say that if only outlaws have guns, or if you outlaw guns, only outlaws will have guns. But I don't think any of us just feel wonderful about the things that people use guns to do in our society these days. So put a number about your fear level on that one. And finally, number 25 I just kind of generally put the fear is on the rise in our country due to the overexposure of all of these scary things. Now, when I, some of you knew my mom. She died a few years ago. When I was growing up, I don't recall my mother ever being much of a worrier. I'm thankful for that. I don't ever remember her saying, be careful every time I left the house. I don't remember her ever waiting up if I, if I got home late. However, as she got older, I would go over to her house, and she'd be watching TV, and she would say, hey, did you hear about that plane crash in Russia? Did you hear those poor people in Japan? They were killed by that earthquake. Or did you see the latest, you know, ISIS attack in the Middle East? And I'd say, no, I, 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 didn't, I did not know all that. I think older people, we, we do worry more, especially if we watch much of the news. I mean, bad things have always happened in the, around the world, right? But now every abduction, every mining disaster, every car wreck, every act of aggression is right there happening in real time on our 60-inch 60, 60 you know, uh, TVs. And it makes the world seem like a scarier place than it really is. So how much do you think that affects your level of fear, the amount of exposure you have to these things on a regular basis? If not a lot, two or three. If it's a lot, but a seven or eight or nine. Now, I think for most of us, the combination of all of these things results 
in greater levels of fear, perhaps even sometimes overwhelming, debilitating fear and anxiety. And it takes a toll. It takes a toll on us emotionally, mentally, maybe even physically. 2,000 years ago when Jesus asked people, why are you so afraid? I may be wrong, but I don't think they had this much stuff to deal with. There could have been, there's probably stuff that we don't have to deal with, probably not this much bombarding them every single day. Bottom line, God does not want you living your life under the constant dark cloud of fear and worry and anxiety. Now, yes, some fears are legitimate. I'm not saying, oh, just don't worry, trust God, and everything will be fine. That's not realistic. But then how can you live your life without the near constant level of fear that is on the verge of maybe even anguish and torment in your life. How can we live our life free of that? Well, I want to end with just these three things. First, determine to live your life through the eyes of faith instead of the eyes of fear. Write that down. Make it a habit. Pray. Ask God to help you to live your life through eyes of faith instead of eyes of fear. Second, I would say be more intentional about the things that you expose your mind and heart to. Of the 25 issues that I mentioned today, how many of you, how many do we really have control over? Right? Not very many we actually have too much control over. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do what we can do, but there's a lot of it. It's just we have to learn how to deal with these things better. Maybe cut back on how much you watch, how much of this you allow to permeate into your heart and into your mind. Third, remember that this world is not your permanent home. You're just passing through. Or as Jesus put it in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live again. Did you know that the term fear not is found 365 times in the Bible? That's one fear not for every day of the year. And on that first Easter and this Easter as well, the resurrected Jesus is saying, in the face of even your greatest fear, I will be with you. So this Easter, be strong. Put your trust and security in God and don't allow fear to rule your life. Let's stand have our closing prayer. Lord, today all of us didn't really need this reminder today so much of all of these factors that are just bombarding us and just beating us down sometimes into fear and anxiety. But, Lord, we need to also be able to put these things into perspective and to say that you're still on your throne, you still are sovereign, you still love us, our lives are still in your hands. Lord, we want to begin, if not, we haven't done, if we haven't done it already, is to live our lives through eyes of faith and trust instead of just eyes of fear. Lord, many of us need to be more careful about what we allow into our hearts and our minds on a regular basis that just disrupt and almost destroy our inner peace. And Lord, we also need to be reminded that this, is, this life, fortunately, as much as we love it, is temporary. This is not our final ending place. And one day all of these fears and all of these problems for us will be over. In the meantime, God, we pray that we would do the things that we can do to make a difference where we can and all along to just trust you and to entrust our lives into your hands and that that would help alleviate our constant worry and fretting and anxiety and fear. So, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us as we leave this place and that this, this lesson will stick with us for a long time to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming today. We will see you next time.